Ismay knew it was cold because he was shivering. He knew he could hear because the sailor standing in the back of the lifeboat was shouting orders. Row, ship your oars. The oar locks clattered. Someone was crying. He heard voices from the other boats, invisible in the darkness. Ismay knew he could see. There was an ocean of stars above him. Every few minutes, a rocket sizzled into the sky and exploded, the bright green light blotting out the heavens. Then the stars returned. None of it made any sense. Time passed. Ismay had no idea how much. The stars faded again, this time replaced by the faint pink tones of dawn. Then there was a new light, lower, a shooting star. He heard a thud that sounded like a cannon, more shooting stars, brighter. They were white flares, Ismay realized. Then, a ship materialized against the brightening sliver of the horizon. Ismay felt sensation returning to his arms and legs. The sailor barked, row. When the lifeboat hove into the lee of the ship, Ismay helped to fend off from the side. The sailor and another man grabbed lines that dropped from above. There was no violence in the sea. It was a calm morning. Ismay sat until someone grabbed his lapel and pulled him to the Jacob's ladder. The dark side of the ship was a 40-foot bluff. In his bed shoes, Ismay lost his footing on every other rung and clung to the ropes. At the top of the ladder, an officer with wide-eyed terror on his face took Ismay by the arm and helped him to the deck. I'm Ismay. He hadn't spoken since he'd gotten into the lifeboat. The words came out in a hoarse whisper. The officer at the rail turned away from him to help the next survivor from the ladder. Ismay walked four paces to the bulkhead of the deckhouse and settled his back against the cold steel. A man in uniform materialized in front of him. I'm Ismay, he said, forcing himself to speak louder. Will you not go into the saloon and get some soup or something to drink? No, if you will leave me alone, I will be very much happier here, Ismay said. If you will get me in some room where I can be quiet, I wish you would. The man put his arm around Ismay's shoulders and coaxed him through a doorway, up some stairs, and into a stateroom, leaving him there in the darkness. At midnight, in the newsroom of the New York Times, managing editor Carr Van Anda heard the clatter of the dispatch box in its metal chute. When a bulletin arrived at the telegraph room on the 18th floor, the operator threw it into a wooden box and lowered it on a rope to the newsroom. Van Anda had just put the first morning edition to bed, with the news that Teddy Roosevelt had beaten William Howard Taft in the Pennsylvania primary election. The bulletin was from the Associated Press in Cape Race, Newfoundland. Sunday night, April 14th, AP. At 10.25 o'clock tonight, the White Star Line steamship Titanic called CQD to the Marconi station here and reported having struck an iceberg. The steamer said that immediate assistance was required. Van Anda called the White Star office and got through to the night duty officer, who knew nothing. Next, he called the Times correspondent in Halifax. The reporter told him that a Canadian ship had picked up the distress call and forwarded it to another ship, Virginian, en route from Halifax to Liverpool. Virginian's captain had changed course and was racing to 41 degrees 46 minutes north, 50 degrees 14 minutes west. The reporter in Halifax also told Van Anda that Olympic and Baltic had confirmed that they'd heard the distress call. The last transmission from Titanic was sloppy, which was surprising since it had been sent by an experienced telegrapher. It said the ship was sinking by the bow and ended abruptly at 12.27 New York time. After that, there'd been a flurry of messages between a half dozen ships and Cape Race, but nothing more from Titanic. Van Anda decided he didn't have enough facts to replace Taft and Roosevelt with the Titanic story in the morning mail edition. He had a few hours to dig into his story for the next edition that afternoon. For the time being, Van Anda posted the news that the world's biggest ocean liner had sent a distress call on the bulletin board in front of the office in Times Square. New liner Titanic hits an iceberg, sinking by the bow at midnight.
women put off in lifeboats, last wireless at 1227 blurred. The morning editions of several newspapers carried stories on the calls for help from the North Atlantic, but reported that they were unconfirmed. Editors at every paper in town loosed a barrage of assignments to their reporters, with orders to get to the bottom of the puzzling story. At White Star headquarters, Philip Franklin, general manager of the line's American operations and vice president of International Mercantile Marine, started taking phone calls from the press at 7 a.m. The hearsay that Titanic had foundered was preposterous, Franklin told them. The ship's telegraph signal fading abruptly was due to a malfunction in the wireless station or atmospheric interference. White Star and IMM were perfectly satisfied that there was no cause for alarm regarding the safety of the passengers. At noon, the Associated Press in Montreal relayed a bulletin from Cape Race for which Franklin had been praying all morning. All Titanic passengers safe, the Virginian towing the liner into Halifax. Franklin went to work fulfilling White Star's obligations to 1,324 passengers who were expecting to land in New York but were going to find themselves in Halifax, 600 miles north. The word about the collision and rescue spread among friends and relatives of the passengers, many of whom rushed to the White Star offices to find out what would happen to their loved ones. At 1 p.m., Franklin chartered a special express train to pick up the stranded passengers in Halifax. Any friends and relatives who wanted to go north to meet them were welcome to ride along. Franklin commandeered the steamer Lady Laurier to sail from Halifax immediately, intercept Virginian and Titanic, and escort them to port. He dictated a telegram and ordered it sent to every known relative of the first-class passengers. All Titanic's passengers safe, liner being towed to Halifax. Titanic updates flew among Marconi stations at sea on both sides of the Atlantic. Newspapers posted hourly bulletins on the walls outside their offices. The new Titanic strikes iceberg and calls for aid, said one. Vessels rush to her side. In London, the Daily Sketch ran a story, datelined Montreal, with the headlines, Calls for Help, Many Great Liners Race to the Rescue. Early that afternoon, the banner on the front page of the New York Sun proclaimed, All saved from Titanic after collision. The rescue was hailed as another triumph for the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. On the afternoon of April 15th, Telegrapher David Sarnoff went to work in downtown Manhattan with the New York Sun tucked under his arm. Sarnoff was a Russian immigrant, born in Uzlian, near Minsk, who had been in America for 12 years. He loved his job with the Marconi Company and believed he was part of a revolution as powerful as the invention of movable type. His first assignment had been at the Marconi station on Nantucket Island. Sarnoff had been off duty on the morning Florida ran into Republic but he'd hurried to work when he'd heard what had happened and had spent the next 48 hours helping transmit bulletins on the rescue. Sarnoff's job in New York didn't involve saving lives, but he was sure New York was a step up from Nantucket. John Wanamaker, the department store tycoon, had installed telegraph stations in his stores to transmit information about sales, inventory, and other company business. At the same time, he offered telegraph service to his customers, giving many of them their first glimpse of the wonderful power of wireless communications. On April 15th, Sarnoff took care of a bit of incoming and outgoing traffic on the company frequency, then switched to the no-man's land of offshore radio waves. Maybe he could pick up something about Titanic. The night before, he had heard faint transmissions between the liner in distress and Olympic, which he'd passed on to the press. From the papers that day, it looked like it had turned into an even bigger rescue story than Republic's. At 4.35 p.m., Sarnoff heard the unmistakable fist of a professional offshore telegrapher, M-C-E-D-E-M-K-C, -E colon, M-C-E. This is M-K-C. From earlier eavesdropping on maritime traffic, Sarnoff knew that M-C-E was Cape Race, Newfoundland and MKC was RMS Olympic. He tuned his receiver to sharpen the signal. The message was from Olympic's captain, Herbert J. Haddock, for relay by landline to the White Star office in New York. Carpathia reached Titanic position at daybreak, found boats and wreckage only, 
Titanic foundered about 2.20 a.m. in 41.16 north, 50.14 west. All her boats accounted for. About 675 souls saved. Leyland Line, SS Californian, remaining in searching position of disaster. Carpathia returning to New York with survivors. Please inform Cunard. Haddock. Sarnoff froze. Olympic sent the message again and again. He took off his headphones, picked up the telephone, and called his boss at the New York office of the Marconi Company to get permission to notify the press. An hour later, extra editions of the major newspapers were on the stands. Sarnoff was riveted to his chair, tapping out Carpathia's call sign. At the White Star office, Philip Franklin read the telegram from Olympic, but could not bring himself to believe the death toll was so high. If Titanic had sunk, and part of him still did not admit that it had, it would have stayed afloat at least long enough for several nearby ships to arrive. When HMS Hawk had slammed into Olympic, Olympic had not only survived, but made it to port under its own power. Titanic was as strong, if not stronger. Franklin went downstairs to make a statement to the swarm of reporters who were milling around in the ticketing hall. Some survivors were aboard Carpathia, Franklin told them. Two other ships that were in the vicinity, Parisian and Virginian, might also have arrived in time to save more passengers and crew. There has probably been a terrible loss of life, he admitted. By midnight, a crowd of hundreds had gathered in front of the White Star office, all of them desperate to know if their loved ones were among those alive aboard Carpathia. In his office, Franklin relinquished the last of his optimism that Titanic was still afloat, called back the train to Halifax, and canceled the Lady Laurier charter. In Times Square, another mob shuffled around all night, waiting for handwritten bulletins from the newspapers on the fate of Titanic. Most of them knew no one on the unlucky ship. They were there because they sensed a primitive disturbance in the rhythms of life that allowed one day to follow another. In Southampton, dawn washed over a thousand women and children gathered on the cobbles in front of the White Star office. All of them lived in row houses within a few blocks of the waterfront. During the night, the rumors and conflicting bulletins had flowed into the seafaring neighborhood. Titanic had hit an iceberg. Another ship was towing it to Halifax. Titanic had hit an iceberg and sank, but everyone aboard was safe on two or three ships that arrived in time to rescue them. In the darkest part of the night, the despicable news rippled from house to house. More than 1,500 of Titanic's passengers and crew were missing. Fewer than 800 had been taken from lifeboats onto Carpathia. The wives of the crewmen stood silently under umbrellas in a soft rain facing the White Star office, hoping that at any minute someone would emerge to tell them that none of them were widows. Daylight on April 16th brought no relief in New York City. Carpathia's Marconi had a range of only 200 miles and could not reach Cape Race. It had cabled the names of a few of the survivors to the nearby Olympic, which had relayed them to New York before steaming eastward on its original course. Nine out of ten people who rushed to the White Star office that morning hoping for good news left in tears when the names of their loved ones were not on the first list of survivors sent by Carpathia. In the newspapers, people around the world read that Titanic had definitely sunk, along with the sketchy details about survivors. The New York American, a Hearst paper, led the way, devoting eight of the 24 pages of its early afternoon edition to the disaster. The crowd outside the White Star office demanding the names of survivors had grown from hundreds to thousands. It was verging on becoming a riot. The policemen, who were already there, called for reinforcements. When Franklin or another White Star officer appeared at the door, the mob surged toward them shouting curses and accusations that they had lied to the world about survivors. Despite the increasingly grim truth that was emerging, hopeful rumors still circulated in New York and Southampton. Some passengers and crew were confirmed to be aboard Virginian, Parisian, or Olympic. Some had saved themselves by climbing from the sinking ship on the iceberg and were waiting there to be rescued. To ease fears that survivors might still be at the scene awaiting rescue, 
Franklin told the crowd outside his office that he had wired Halifax and chartered another ship to speed to Titanic's last reported position. He didn't tell them that the cable-laying steamer, McKay Bennett, would carry a mortician, a chaplain, a cargo of pine caskets, and 40 tons of ice in the hold for preserving bodies. In Washington, the news reached President Taft, who was already reeling from his defeat in Pennsylvania at the hands of his once close friend and mentor, Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt had served two terms as president, decided not to run for a third, and hand-picked Taft to succeed him. Roosevelt had counted on Taft to stay the progressive course he had set for the Republican Party. But Taft had taken the GOP in the opposite direction. Now, Roosevelt had not just beaten Taft in Pennsylvania, he had routed him. For Taft, the additional bad news that his friend Archie Bunt might be lost at sea was devastating. On the morning of April 17th, Taft still did not know if Butt was dead or alive. He sent a telegram to Franklin asking for news about his friend and advisor. Taft waited two hours. Franklin did not reply. Taft was incensed that the man had ignored him. He ordered the fast Navy Scout cruisers Chester and Salem to sortie from Norfolk, Virginia, make contact with Carpathia, and demand a complete list of survivors. While Taft was sending the Navy to run down Carpathia, William Alden Smith was across town reading the newspaper coverage of the disaster. Smith was 52 years old, had served his first term in one of Michigan's two Senate seats, and was almost certain to be reelected the following year. Smith had a reputation in Congress as a man who could seize attention by gauging the right psychological moment and then hold it with sheer showmanship. As Smith read about Titanic, he was struck by a bizarre coincidence. He reached into his wallet and pulled out a yellowed newspaper clipping from 1902. It was a poem about a shipwreck that had strangely moved him ten years earlier. Until that moment, he had forgotten that he still had it. Then she, the stricken hull, the doomed, the beautiful, proudly to fate abased her brow, Titanic. Smith noticed another coincidence, too. There on the front pages of every newspaper on his desk was a photograph of Captain E.J. Smith. Six years earlier, then-Congressman Smith and his son had crossed the Atlantic aboard Baltic under the command of E.J. Smith. The captain had invited him and his son to dinner, then took them on a tour of the bridge. Congressman Smith was a student of human behavior, and he'd pegged Captain Smith as an extremely level-headed, safety-conscious mariner. Every newspaper Senator Smith read carried a story about Captain Smith's recklessness in running too fast through a known ice field. One reporter asked naval architect Robert Stocker to look at Titanic specifications, evaluate the time the ship had stayed afloat, and offer a conclusion. The Titanic must have been making full speed ahead when she collided with the iceberg, he said, and evidently her compartments must have been sprung from bow to stern. That was not the E.J. Smith whom Senator Smith knew. The papers painted Titanic's captain as a reckless fool. But that simply could not be true. If it wasn't, Smith wondered, what had happened to the ship? What about the ice warnings the papers said Smith had received? Why had the world's largest, finest, and safest passenger ship foundered on its maiden voyage? Two days after the disaster, while Carpathia was still steaming to New York, either out of range or maintaining radio silence, millions of people all over America and Europe were asking the same questions. The newspapers were answering them with accusations and supposition. Smith thought the poem in his wallet was way too much of a coincidence to not mean something. What it meant, he decided, was that he was the man to get the real answers. With a flash of certainty, he knew that his entire life had led him to that moment. Smith called the White House and reached Taft's secretary, Charles Hillis. What did the president intend to do about the Titanic disaster, Smith asked. Most likely, Hillis replied, the president will do nothing. That morning, Smith drafted a resolution to convene a panel to investigate the wreck of Titanic under the auspices of the Committee on Commerce, of which he was a member. <laughs> 
At the beginning of the day's Senate session, Smith interrupted the prayer by the chaplain to present his resolution. By unanimous consent, the Senate gave Smith's committee the authority to conduct an investigation to determine what had happened to RMS Titanic on the night of April 14th to 15th, 1912. The Commerce Committee chairman, Senator Newt Nelson, appointed Smith as chairman. The panel of inquisitors would have an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, with a liberal, moderate, and conservative member of each party. The next day, April 18th, Smith set his titanic inquiry aside to tend to some business on his upcoming re-election campaign in Michigan. He was dictating a letter to his ally, the governor, when the telephone rang. Smith answered it himself. It was a commander at the Department of the Navy, calling at the request of President Taft. The cruisers Chester and Salem had finally made contact with Carpathia. For reasons that were not entirely clear, Carpathia's captain had declined to send a complete list of survivors. The president was furious, and the cruisers were continuing to transmit their demands to Carpathia. Smith was stunned. Carpathia had turned down a request by the President of the United States. There's more, the commander said. The warships had intercepted a telegram from Carpathia that might be of interest to the committee getting ready to investigate the disaster. Read it, Smith said. To P.A.S. Franklin White Star, most desirable Titanic crew should be returned home earliest moment possible. Suggest you hold Cedric, sailing her daylight Friday. Propose returning in her myself. Yamsey. Who is Yamsey? Smith asked. We believe it is J. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line and president of International Mercantile Marine. He owns Titanic and was aboard the ship. He's alive? Smith asked. Apparently, sir, the commander said. Smith slowly hung his telephone earpiece on the hook switch and sorted through what he had just heard. The man who owned the ship had definitely survived. Why? This Ismay wanted to spirit Titanic's crew out of New York as soon as Carpathia arrived. Why? Of course, Smith realized. Once Ismay and the crew were off American soil, he would have no way to subpoena them to testify before his committee. A minute later, Smith had the solution. If Ismay and his crew would not come to Washington to present themselves to his committee, then Washington would go to them. He called the White House, got Hillis, and arranged a noon meeting with the president. Minutes before Smith arrived in the Oval Office, the cruisers had intercepted the full list of surviving first-class passengers and transmitted it to the president. Archie Butt was not on it. Smith was shocked to see Taft looking so distraught. His face was bright red, his collar soaked with sweat, his breath coming in gasps. Smith disagreed with Taft on most political issues, but he liked him personally, and he felt sorry for the man. Smith thanked the president for seeing him at so difficult a time. He said he hoped the president appreciated the importance of the investigation to the nation. Taft responded that he supported Smith's resolution and the formation of the committee. He would do everything in his power to help the inquiry. Smith asked the president if it was legal to subpoena British citizens and hold them in the United States until they testified. Taft called the Attorney General, George Wickersham, who told him that Congress was perfectly justified in holding Ismay and the crew in the country until they satisfied the committee. It was highly unlikely that the British would raise diplomatic objections. Smith had three more requests. First, he wanted Secretary of Commerce and Labor Charles Nagel who was in charge of immigration, to go to New York with the committee to make things as easy as possible for the steerage passengers arriving in the country for the first time. Taft agreed. Second, Smith wanted George Euler, the government's top steamship inspector, to join the panel. Taft agreed. Finally, Smith asked the president to dispatch a U.S. Treasury revenue cutter to rendezvous with Carpathia to be sure no one left the ship before it reached the dock. Taft said he would have the cutter underway within the hour. Smith thanked Taft and told him that he and a few members of his committee were taking an afternoon train to New York. They would arrive just before Carpathia docked.
At three o'clock on the afternoon of April 18th, Smith went to Union Station. As he made his way to the train, he was mobbed by reporters. He had hoped to keep his precipitous departure from Washington a secret. But the next best thing to secrecy was telling the truth. Smith held a walking press conference, informing the reporters about the intercepted cable from Ismay and his conversation with President Taft, and naming the members of his committee and its advisors. Are you going to arrest Bruce Ismay, Senator? A reporter shouted. We are not going into this matter with a club, Smith replied. The officers of the White Star Line must respond to congressional action frankly and honestly if they are to enjoy the privileges of American ports and retain the confidence of the American people. The hearings will begin tomorrow at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. Unless Ismay is ill or incapacitated, he will be subpoenaed and he will testify. In England, April 18th had been a day of national mourning. Memorial services in England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales had drawn hundreds of thousands of mourners. Alexander M. Carlyle, the retired Harlan and Wolfe director, who had helped design Titanic, had fainted in a church in London and had been taken to the hospital. In Aix-en-Provence, France, plans for a grand celebration of J.P. Morgan's 75th birthday fell apart when the news about Titanic reached him. The next day, his mood plummeted further when he received a cable from his son Jack in New York telling him that the newspapers and Congress seemed to have concluded that Bruce Ismay was to blame for the disaster. Peary remained in seclusion aboard Valiant and did not yet know of the tragedy. Franklin had cabled Harland and Wolfe as soon as he knew for sure that the ship was gone. Then later, when he knew that Thomas Andrews had perished with it. At the shipyard, Edward Wilding received the news as he convened the monthly meeting of the company directors on April 16th. He excused himself and discreetly sent a cable to Margaret Peary for her eyes only. She decided not to tell her husband. At 9.07 p.m., the train from Washington chuffed through the tunnel under the Hudson River into Pennsylvania Station on West 34th Street in New York. A delegation from the Port of New York was on the platform. Hurry, they told Smith. Carpathia was in sight, escorted by the USS Manhattan. The ship was already past the Statue of Liberty, just minutes from docking. They had cabs standing by to take Smith and his party to Cunard's Pier 54. In the darkness, Smith's convoy of taxis hurtled down 7th Avenue. Just before heading into the narrower streets of Lower Manhattan, the cab snapped a right onto West 14th Street. Before reaching 8th Avenue, they slowed to a crawl. The cobbled thoroughfare leading to the river was jammed with cars, trucks, horses, and people surging toward the waterfront. The cab drivers leaned on their horns, but it took them 20 minutes to cover five blocks, reaching Pier 54 at 932. Policemen held thousands of people behind a rope barrier hung with flickering green gas lanterns. A strong west wind blew off the river, carrying a light mist that threatened to become a chilly rain. Carpathia was already tied to the pier. Smith took off on his own, pushed his way through the crowd to the police gate, told the guard who he was, and ran for the canopied gangway. At the top of the gangway, Smith caught his breath and squared up in front of one of the two officers, helping passengers from the ship. I am Senator William Alden Smith, and I am here to see Mr. J. Bruce Ismay, he said. One of the officers shrugged at the other, then nodded to Smith. Follow me, he said. The officer escorted Smith into the ship, up a stairway, and along a corridor that smelled of sweat, stale kitchen aromas, and cigarette smoke. He stopped in front of a door on which was a hand-lettered sign. Please do not knock. Smith had seen a newspaper photograph of Bruce Ismay, who was rabbit-like, with a thin face and small eyes. The man who answered the stateroom door aboard Carpathia was beefy and florid. He introduced himself as Philip Franklin and told Smith that Ismay was far too ill to receive a guest. Smith shouldered his way past Franklin, who put up no resistance. The stateroom smelled worse than the corridor, a combination of must, vomit, and cologne. Ismay was slouched in a chair, his hair matted, 
It was obvious that he had not washed in several days. He was shaking visibly and did not make eye contact with Smith. Smith recited the command he had practiced on the train. I am empowered by the Congress of the United States to demand that you refrain from leaving my country until my committee has the opportunity to question you about the events surrounding the sinking of Titanic. If necessary, I will issue a subpoena to detain you. In a voice that was weak but surprisingly clear, considering his disheveled condition, Ismay told Smith that a subpoena would not be necessary. He would cooperate in any way he could. Smith asked about the surviving crew members, still afraid that Ismay would spirit them out of the country before he could interview them. Most of the crew died, Ismay said. The ones who did not die were at the Institute of the Seaman's Friend. He told Smith to let Franklin know whom he wanted to interview, and Franklin would make it happen. Ismay said he had considered taking his crew to England immediately, only because he wanted to reunite them with their families as soon as possible. The following morning, the chairman of the White Star Line looked better, but not good, when he walked into the East Room of the Waldorf Astoria. Ismay was carefully groomed, wearing a dark blue suit, starched white shirt, and black tie. His eyes moved around constantly, like those of a prey animal. The formal reception hall, with brocade drapes, floral print wallpaper, and sparkling glass chandeliers, had been arranged so that the only furniture was a large conference table in its center and straight-back chairs against the walls. The room had been open to reporters and onlookers at 9 a.m., and it filled up in minutes. An hour later, it was a fog of cigarette smoke. The tone inside verged on that of a mob rather than a hearing of the United States Senate. As Ismay walked in, trays of photo flash powder added the stench of burning magnesium to the air. Smith, who was sitting at the conference table, yelled, Get those cameras out of here! Mr. Ismay, Smith began with no preliminary remarks, will you kindly tell the committee the circumstances surrounding your voyage and as succinctly as possible, your place on the ship on the voyage, together with any circumstances you feel would be helpful to us in the inquiry? Ismay shut his eyes, opened them, and spoke. His tone was firm, his accent so crisp that it sounded like a theatrical parody of the way an upper-class Englishman spoke. In the first place, I would like to express my sincere grief at this deplorable catastrophe. I understand that you gentlemen have been appointed as a committee of the Senate to inquire into the circumstances. So far as we are concerned, we welcome it. We have nothing to conceal, nothing to hide. The ship was built in Belfast, she was the latest thing in the art of shipbuilding. Absolutely no money was spared in her construction. Smith let Ismay talk for ten minutes without interruption. He described Titanic sea trials and the departure from Southampton, leaving out the incident with SS New York. Without notes, Ismay recited the speed of the ship and number of propeller revolutions at which the engines were turning for each day of the voyage it was immediately obvious to Smith that he was responding to criticism about the speed of the ship that had surfaced in the newspapers. Ismay bluntly stated that a full-speed test of the ship had been tentatively scheduled for the day after the disaster, but the Titanic had never in its life reached its top speed. He had in no way encouraged Captain Smith to increase speed to reach New York ahead of schedule. Senator Smith had mentally sketched his agenda for the investigation on the train north from Washington and through the night at the hotel in New York. Stories help people make sense of the world. Smith wanted to write the story of Titanic in his report to the nation so it would not seem like random death, which was far too difficult to understand. He was sure that the iceberg alone did not account for the magnitude of the tragedy. The facts had to be right. Smith wanted to know what had happened. Why did an unsinkable ship go down so quickly? Why were there not enough lifeboats for all the passengers? Why were more people not saved? Who was to blame? Titanic sailed under the British flag, but it was owned by J.P. Morgan. Smith had been an enemy of Morgan's and an opponent of trusts and monopolies. Whatever conclusions his committee reached, they had to emerge from a scrupulously transparent and unbiased process. 
Smith knew that the British would conduct their own inquiry, but on their home soil, where the invisible forces of their internal politics were much more likely to govern their conclusions. Smith recognized that it was also his duty to give Ismay a chance to respond to the accusations by the press and others who had vilified him. Most of what had been written about Ismay centered on the simple fact that he had left the sinking ship while 1,504 men, women, and children who held tickets on his magnificent ocean liner died horribly in the freezing water. Smith had allowed Ismay to turn his opening testimony into a defense against accusations that Titanic was running at full speed through the ice field. Now it was time to find out why he got into the lifeboat. Will you describe what you did after the collision? Smith asked. Ismay recalled the terrible night. The impact woke him up. Captain Smith told him the ship had hit an iceberg. He never mentioned sinking. Ismay went to the engine room. Chief Engineer Joseph Bell said he too thought the ship had suffered major damage, but he was confident that it would stay afloat. One of Smith's aides brought in a profile of Titanic on an easel. Smith asked questions about speed, the extent of the damage to the ship, and the scene on the boat deck, and arrived at the ultimate moment. Ismay used the profile to show where he was at various times after Titanic hit the iceberg. What were the circumstances of your departure from the ship? Smith asked. The lifeboat was there. The officer called out, asking if there were any more women, and there was no response. There were no passengers left on deck. There were no passengers on deck, Smith repeated, unable to stifle an incredulous note in his voice that sent a wave of murmuring through the crowd. No, sir, Ismay said. As the boat was being lowered away, I got into it. Smith led Ismay through Titanic's final moments. Ismay said he was facing away from the ship when it went down that he was grateful that he had not seen it sink, that Titanic was in one piece the last time he looked at it. Ismay shut his eyes in mid-sentence and stopped talking. Smith changed the subject. Do you know whether the ship was equipped with its full complement of lifeboats? If she had not been, Ismay said, sounding exasperated with Smith's interrogation tactics. She could not have sailed. Smith excused Ismay, telling him to remain available in the United States for recall. The reporters broke for the exits to launch extra editions of their papers with the excuses of the man who'd fled his sinking ship, leaving hundreds of innocents to die. After lunch, Smith called Carpathia's captain Arthur Rostron to the witness chair, knowing that the testimony of the disaster's most obvious hero would be a dramatic counterpoint to that of its villain. After rising to greet Rostron as he entered, Smith let the captain roam at will through his account of racing to Titanic to pick up the survivors in lifeboats. The whole thing was absolutely providential, Rostron said. I will tell you this, that the wireless operator was in his cabin at the time, not on official business at all, but just simply listening as he was undressing. He was unlacing his boots. He had his listening apparatus on his ear, and the message came. That was the whole thing. In ten minutes, he would have been in bed, and we would not have heard the message. A few in the audience were so moved by Rostron's tale of his lucky Marconi operator that they applauded. Then the mood changed, from one of relief at that bit of good luck, to one in which the stark reality of what Rostron saw dragged the crowd into a place so dark it dismantled the pretensions of order they trusted the hearing to maintain. By the time we had the first boat's people, it was breaking day. I could see the remaining boats within an area of about four miles. I saw icebergs all around me. I maneuvered the ship and we gradually got all the boats together. There was hardly any wreckage, only small pieces of broken up stuff. Rostron paused. By 8.30, all the people were on board. I asked for the purser and told him that I wanted... Rostron stopped, stifled a sob, and began to weep. I wanted a short prayer of thankfulness for those rescued, 
and a burial service for those who were lost. The hearing was transformed from an inquisition into a funeral service. Many wept openly, including Smith, who leaned across the table and grasped Rostron's forearm. Rostron went on. I then got an Episcopal clergyman, one of our passengers, and asked if he would do this for me, which he did willingly. While they were holding the service, I was on the bridge, of course, and I maneuvered around the scene of the wreckage. We saw nothing except one body. Floating, Smith said hoarsely. Floating. The room was absolutely quiet for a long minute. Smith broke the silence with a line of questioning about the authority of Titanic's captain. Rostron said he knew Smith, and knew without a doubt that he would never have taken orders to increase speed or anything else from Ismay or any official of the company who happened to be aboard. At sea, immediately I leave port until I arrive at port. The captain is in absolute control and takes orders from no one, he said. And neither would E.J. Smith. Ismay, who was sitting inconspicuously against the wall, slumped with relief. Rostron had effectively refuted the charge for which Ismay had been tried and convicted by Hearst and the rest of the American press. He had not ordered Captain Smith to fire all boilers to break a speed record, because after 30 years in the shipping business, he would know that Smith would never have obeyed such an order. One more question, Smith said. Some complaint has been made because the message of the President of the United States, which was sent to the Carpathia, was not answered. Do you know anything about that? I heard last night that there was a message about a major bot, Rostron said. I asked my purser about it. He said, yes, Olympic sent a message asking if Major Butt was on board. It was answered, not on board. That is the only thing I know about it. Smith thanked Rostron, shook his hand, and called a break. Charles Lightoller, the highest-ranking member of Titanic's surviving crew, appeared in the hearing room wearing the blue working uniform in which he had left the ship. Ismay and Rostron had been dramatic, but one of them was not a mariner, and the other had not been aboard Titanic. Smith hoped Lightoller would be a willing and expert eyewitness. Lightoller's first few answers to Smith's questions revealed him to be terse and guarded. When did you board Titanic? In Belfast. When? March 19th or 20th. Did you make the so-called trials? Yes, sir. Of what did they consist? Turning circles and adjusting compasses. If Lightoller wanted to play criminal defendant with Smith, then Smith would happily oblige him with a grilling he would never forget. For two hours without a break, Smith peppered Lightoller with questions. Lightoller parried with vague and evasive answers. I wish you would describe a life belt, Smith said. After two questions on the same topic, that Lightoller slipped like a boxer ducking punches. It consists of a series of pieces of cork. A hole is cut in there, he said, pointing to an illustration on an easel. For the head to go through, and this falls over front and back, and there are tapes from the back then tied around the front. It is a new idea and very effective, because no one can make a mistake in putting it on. Smith interrupted. Have you ever been into the sea with one of them? Yes, sir. Where? From the Titanic. How long were you in the sea with the life belt on? Between half an hour and an hour. What time did you leave the ship? I didn't leave it. Did the ship leave you? Yes, sir. I wish you would tell us whether the suction incidental to the sinking of this vessel was a great deterrent in making progress away from the boat. It was hardly noticeable. Smith left Light Toller at the moment he was swept into the sea to ask him whether third-class passengers were allowed on the boat deck. Of course, Light Toller told him. There was no restraint at all. Everyone was calm and orderly. Lightoller said neither he nor any of the passengers believed Titanic was in danger of sinking, even after they started launching lifeboats. He had heard and felt the impact of the iceberg from his cabin, but thought it was nothing serious.
When Lightoller described the events that followed the impact, he closed his eyes as though visualizing himself walking to the bridge, learning that the ship had struck something, and receiving Captain Smith's order to launch the lifeboats. His brows pinched in a clearly sorrowful expression. He had shown no emotion until then. Smith set off on a long line of questioning about the process for measuring the temperature of the sea, Marconi messages warning of ice in the vicinity, the speed of the ship, the changing of the watch shortly before impact, and Captain Smith's order to launch the lifeboats. Smith's interrogation of Light Toller was making those of Ismay and Rostron seem like parlor chats. After a break, Light Toller's responses were still terse and evasive, but colored by impatience. Smith detected weakness and brought him back to the moment when he'd abandoned ship. Where did you last see the captain? On the boat deck, sir. Was the vessel broken in two or intact? Absolutely intact. On the decks? Intact, sir. Smith asked Lightoller why he launched his first lifeboats half empty. Lightoller shocked Smith by replying that he believed the situation was not serious enough to risk lowering inexperienced passengers 70 feet down into the water in fully loaded boats. Silence filled the East Room as everyone thought the same thing. How could the fourth highest ranking officer on the ship not have known that the situation was urgent? Smith finally spoke. Supposing you had known it was urgent, what would you have done? I would have acted to the best of my judgment then. Tell me what you would have thought wise, Smith shot back at him. I would have taken more risks. Smith pounded away on the loading of the lifeboats for 15 more minutes. But Lightoller seemed to have hit his weakest moment and gained renewed strength. It took Smith a half hour to extract a second-by-second -second description of Titanic sinking. The absence of crying and lamentation among the dying crew and passengers. The explosion Lightoller felt when he was in the water under the overturned lifeboat. Smith gauged the mood of the crowd. It was generally unsympathetic to Lightoller's diffidence, but he didn't want to risk pushing it any further. If Smith continued, it might look like he was badgering the poor officer who had his ship leave him. He excused Lightoller, but told him he would definitely be recalled. Smith was exhausted. After a ten-minute recess, he was not in a mood to engage in another battle of wits. He called Carpathia's Marconi operator, Harold Cottam, who spent a congenial 30 minutes describing Titanic's distress call and the exchanges of messages with other ships and shore stations over the next 72 hours. Smith ended the session with first-class steward Alfred Crawford, who brought the room to tears for the second time that day. Did you know Mr. and Mrs. Strauss? Smith asked. I stood at the boat where they refused to get in, Crawford replied. He had the calm-mannered voice of an English butler. Did Mrs. Strauss get into the boat? She attempted to get into the boat first, and she got back out again. Her maid got into the boat. What do you mean by she attempted to get in? She went to get over from the deck to the boat, but then went back to her husband. What followed? She said, we have been living together for many years. Where you go, I go. The first session was over, but the long day was not. While Smith and his committee were taking testimony at the Waldorf Astoria, hundreds of newspapers were interviewing their own witnesses and printing whatever they said. There was no such thing as a bad Titanic story, or one that was not taken for the truth. Ismay told Smith the ship never went over 75 revolutions and 21.5 knots. The evening edition of the New York Times and dozens of its corresponding papers around the world ran an interview with Titanic fireman John Thompson. He said, From the time we left Queenstown until the moment of the shock, it never went below 74. During that whole Sunday, we'd been keeping up to 77. Surely she was going full speed then. Smith announced that he was not reading newspapers and that the only legally binding conclusions would come from the inquiry.
Courts in the United States would consider only sworn testimony in deciding whether or not White Star and International Mercantile Marine were concealing negligence aboard Titanic. If they were, they would be liable for damages under American shipping laws because the ship was owned by a trust chartered in the United States. The critical question was, was Ismay, as president of IMM and chairman of White Star, aware of any negligence in the building of the ship or its operation? If the answer to that question was yes, then hundreds of American citizens could sue Morgan's trust. In all likelihood, they would win. Late Friday evening, Smith and his committee agreed that Light Toller was concealing something, but they weren't sure what. The main thing they derived from his testimony was that Titanic surviving crew members would probably say as little as possible to avoid negligence charges. After the hearing, Ismay had pleaded with Smith to let him return with the crew on the steamer Lapland, scheduled to leave the following morning. Smith had refused. While he believed Ismay to be innocent of the worst suspicions bandied about in the press, he did not think it would be fair to citizens of the United States to let him and his crew return to England, where American law could not reach them. Minutes after Smith told Ismay he could not leave the country, an IMM lawyer repeated the plea. The company simply could not be responsible for the bed and board of more than 200 British citizens in New York for the duration of the hearings. Fine, Smith told him. I want Ismay, the four surviving officers, and a dozen or two crewmen. Which crewmen? The lawyer asked. Smith said he'd get a list to him first thing in the morning. At midnight, an old friend of Smith's from Michigan, Sheriff Joe Bayless, arrived. Bayless had taken a night train to New York and spent the day at the Institute of the Seaman's Friend, eavesdropping on members of Titanic's crew. He handed Smith a list of 29 crewmen who had either been in charge of a lifeboat or who were freely telling horror stories about the ship's navigation and management. Smith asked Bayless to come back at first light, saying he would give him subpoenas for all of them. Then Smith and one of his Senate aides stayed up for another two hours preparing the documents. The following morning, Bayless served the subpoenas while Smith grappled with the implications of a report that had reached him at breakfast. The British consul in New York was at that moment on a train to Washington to protest the Senate's treatment of the crew of Titanic and White Star officials. The IMM lawyers had spent the better part of the night on the phone with senators and congressmen friendly to J.P. Morgan, arguing that a federal committee could not legally subpoena foreigners in the sovereign state of New York. Smith sized it up as a state's rights versus the federal government debate that would go nowhere. Still, he wasn't going to take any chances. He had already heard enough to know that White Star was going to lean heavily on the men on its payroll to keep any hint of negligence out of the committee record. He hoped he was a good enough interrogator to penetrate the wall of half-truths they would erect, but he couldn't do it if they left the country. Smith didn't want to risk letting Morgan swing enough weight to quash his subpoenas in New York, so he decided to go back to Washington and continue his hearings on federal territory. He would hear testimony from one more witness in New York, a man who was too ill to travel, then leave town immediately. Marconi operator Harold Bride appeared in the East Room of the Waldorf in a wheelchair, looking like a sick, frightened teenage boy. He testified for a little over an hour, his voice weakening by the minute, as he described sending the distress calls, Carpathia's response, and the confusion in the radio sphere over the Atlantic until Captain Smith relieved him. Bride's voice was almost a whisper when he told how he was swept into the water and clambered atop the overturned boat. Bride said he was the last man invited on board. Everyone on the overturned boat was a member of the crew. Smith asked Bride what he saw in the water around the overturned lifeboat. Dozens and dozens of men, women and children, Bride said, struggling to get on. To Smith, it was obvious that Bride was telling the truth. Light Toller, who had said the people in the water were some distance away, was a liar. 
Was Lightoller also lying about the ship being intact until it sank? About the loading of the lifeboats? Who else from Titanic's crew was going to lie to him? Smith called a recess until three in the afternoon. Before he left the room, Joe Bayliss took him aside. Lapland had sailed that morning with five of the men Smith had subpoenaed aboard. The others had agreed to testify. Smith pulled Bayliss into the lobby, went to a phone, and called the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Send a cable to Lapland, now leaving New York Harbor, he told the duty officer who answered the call. Order Lapland to await a federal boarding party. Two hours later, Bayliss arrived off Sandy Hook on the Navy tug Barrett, boarding the idling Lapland, and took the final five men on the witness list into custody. At three o'clock, Smith read a statement canceling the next hearing. The committee would resume taking testimony on Monday in Washington to hear from the rest of the crew who had been subpoenaed, and also from many of the passengers. On his way out of the hotel, surrounded by a clutch of reporters, Smith said, the surface has barely been scratched. The real investigation is yet to come. On the day Senator Smith was fleeing New York, Margaret Peary prepared to tell her husband that Titanic was gone, and Thomas Andrews was dead. Edward Wilding's cable about the disaster had reached her two days earlier, when Valiant was inbound for the Thames, with the Danish coast well behind. It was not a moment for mincing words. Titanic had sunk, Margaret said, from the chair next to his berth where she had spent countless hours. It hit an iceberg and was gone in just over two hours. Tommy Andrews died a hero helping others to survive. All nine Harland and Wolf men who were with him were lost. She gave him what other details she had. Hundreds were dead. The Americans were holding Ismay and the crew to interrogate them. Peary bucked against his pillows as though he had been shot. He lay without speaking in his dimly lit stateroom for what seemed like an hour, finally asking Margaret for his lap desk. To his sister, Thomas Andrews's mother, Peary wrote in longhand on a piece of plain, deckled stationery, telling her, A finer fellow than Tommy never lived. Peary told her that Andrews had been brave and unselfish to the end. Peary told Margaret to be sure his note went to Belfast by special courier as soon as Valiant reached London, then asked her for a telegraph pad. Sick, sore, and saddened beyond anything he'd ever thought he would have to endure, Peary went to work. Valiant had a low-voltage wireless transmitter, but it was powerful enough to reach the shore station at Ramsgate at the mouth of the Thames. His first cable went to Edward Wilding at Harland and Wolfe. Find out what happened to that ship, Peary. 93 years later, Roger Long stared at a television monitor in his office in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, trying to make sense of the newly found pieces of Titanic. They were definitely part of the bottom of a ship. The bilge keels and red anti-fouling paint were unmistakable. But he had no idea where they fit into the hull. Unless he could orient them correctly, the patterns of bending and tearing left in the edges of the steel would tell him nothing. He had to know two things. First, where did the pieces come from? They were obviously part of the middle section of the ship, because that's where the bilge keels were, and he could clearly see parts of the bilge keels. But exactly where did they fit in the puzzle of tortured steel? Second, he had to figure out what the hull had done as it came apart. Bend up, bend down twist. The narrow views from the video cameras made it impossible to answer those questions. Long asked Chatterton and Kohler to hire Titanic artist Ken Marshall to look at the video. Then draw three-dimensional images of the pieces of the bottom and their places on the ship. Three weeks later, Marshall's archaeological quality drawings arrived at Long's office. They showed the pieces interlocking to fill a huge gap in the bottom directly under the third funnel where Long believed Titanic had broken in two. Marshall also sent detailed representations of each piece, showing them from the top, ends, and sides where the bilge keels were visible. Using Marshall's drawings to orient him, Long went back to his video monitor. He focused on the condition of the steel at the edges of the new bottom pieces, 
comparing it with the edges of the bow and stern sections of the main wreckage. He saw evidence of both compression and tension failure of the ship's outer and inner bottoms. At some point, Titanic had bent down like a shallow V, then up like an inverted V. It would take a much more complex process than the high angle break to explain what the steel from the ship's bottom was telling him. My God, Long thought when it hit him. The ship didn't break up as it was sinking. It broke at a low angle on the surface and then sank. As Long went over the events of the breakup and sinking with that new assumption, he realized that the end would have been less dramatic than the high angle break scenario. But it would have been far more terrible in terms of what the doomed passengers and crew experienced. In the high angle break scenario, everyone on board knew the ship was starting its final plunge. There was no doubt that they would soon be in the water. If Titanic broke at a low angle, however, it would have happened during a period of apparent calm. Titanic would have been settling slowly as water flooded into the ship. Hundreds of people still inside the warm interior, without intercoms to tell them otherwise, would have believed they were awaiting rescue aboard a ship that would float for several more hours. For those still on Titanic, stranded after the departure of the lifeboats, the dreadful message that they were about to die would have come in the form of loud cracks and shivering under their feet when the hull broke. Less than five minutes later, the entire ship was underwater. Long was sure that the low angle break took place well before Titanic pitched forward into its final plunge. That meant the timing of the sinking was determined by the structural failure and not the flooding. The ship would have remained afloat for some time longer if the hull had not broken. If Titanic had lasted only a few minutes more, it could have meant life for people who would have had time to cobble together a life raft of deck chairs. If it had lasted another hour, the half-empty lifeboats could have returned to pick up hundreds more. If it had lasted an hour and 40 minutes longer, Carpathia would have arrived. Long could not be sure exactly how long the ship would have stayed afloat if it had not broken, but he knew that the Titanic story had just blown wide open. The following week, Long brought his theory to Chatterton and Kohler. He used a plan of the ship to show them the stages of flooding of the bow and center compartment, and Marshall's drawings of the bottom plates to illustrate how they broke and fell away as the ship bent under the third funnel. It's heretical on two counts, Long said. First, the high angle break has been accepted for so long there is going to be a storm of opposition when we trot out my scenario. It's the biggest scene in the movie, for crying out loud. The conventional wisdom said that the ship was strong enough to lift its own stern that far out of the water before it broke. A paper by the architect who worked for the last American company to design a large ocean liner and a professor of naval architecture at one of the top schools in the country was full of analysis of the ship at 45 degrees. Titanic's hull should have been strong enough to go to 45 degrees, but it broke at around 11 degrees. It had to be deeply flawed in some way that its designers and builders did not anticipate. Long said that was a big hole in his theory. The principles of hull strength were well understood when Titanic was built. The ship simply could not have been so weak. Long's conclusions took the investigation in an entirely new and unexpected direction. Chatterton and Kohler had come to his office prepared to hear a version of the grounding theory. If there was even the slightest possibility that Long was right about the low-angle breakup, they had to keep going. Why not present their new theory to people who knew much more than they did about the wreck? Long called Bill Lang, who agreed to host a conference of some of the most respected Titanic theorists at Woods Hole. He invited David G. Brown, Ken Marshall, Simon Mills, and Parks Stevenson, all of whom had been advisors on the expedition that discovered the missing pieces. For decades, they had studied the construction of the ship, accounts of the sinking by survivors, and the behavior of the passengers and crew. They would be able to quickly punch more holes in Long's theory, or fill in the one he already had. Long's low-angle breakup theory, with or without the hole, was sensational news.
during Titanic's last moments as Long described them, death came for 1,500 people in a much more terrible way than everyone thought it had. The sudden breakup eliminated the hope that all or part of the ship might stay afloat and save them. Chatterton and Kohler gave the story to the Associated Press, which had broken their discovery of U-869 and invited a reporter to the Woods Hall meeting. At 9.30 on the morning of December 5th, a dozen people milled around Billy Lang's laboratory, drinking coffee and eating pastries. They all knew one another, at least from internet forums or emails, and had often disagreed bitterly on crucial points about the ship. In person, they went out of their way to be gracious. The conference in Lang's lab was a rare opportunity to participate in something other than endless discussions that went nowhere because there was never any new evidence from the wreck. Simon Mills arrived with a sheaf of plans for the Olympic-class ships from the British National Archives. He took Long aside and asked if he had ever seen a drawing of one of Olympic's expansion joints, the gaps in the superstructure designed by Thomas Andrews to allow it to flex. Long had lain awake the night before knowing that he had no answer for the big question that was sure to come. How could Harland and Wolfe have built a ship so weak that the hull would fail the way he thought it had? Olympic and Titanic had been built from the same set of plans. Now, there on the drawing in front of him were the details of an expansion joint so primitive and crude that it could easily explain the difference in strength between a ship that should have been strong enough to lift its stern to a 45-degree angle and one that had failed at 11 degrees. Long was familiar with the technology of the expansion joint. He also knew that this design feature had fallen out of favor long ago because even after decades of development since the Titanic design, it was still structurally suspect. He turned from the table and burst into the group where Chatterton, Kohler, and Wolfinger were talking. You have to see this, he said, motioning them over to the drawing of the expansion joint. The root of the joint has a small radius that would create an enormous concentration of stress in the hull right where it began to break under the third funnel. Long, a calm, precise analyst, was as excited as a man seeing his lottery numbers tick onto the television screen. The stress in the area just below where these two plates are riveted to the main hull would have been off the charts, he said. Once a small crack started there, it would have run quickly through the most highly stressed part of the hull. This could explain everything. Long rarely expressed an opinion off the top of his head, especially about something as potentially important as an explanation for how a great shipbuilder could have built a weak ship he decided not to incorporate the implications of a crude and dangerous expansion joint into his presentation that morning. But when he stood up to speak, he felt a lot better about the hole in his low-angle brake theory. The weight of the water in the bow was not only lifting the stern out of the water, Long began, it was bending the ship. When a structure like a steel hull or a girder bends, the top of it stretches while the bottom of it is pushed together. Tension at top, compression at bottom. He used a pencil to demonstrate the hull bending, pointing out that the top of the ship would have been affected differently than the bottom. The edges of the top decks where the ship came apart are mangled and crushed. The edges of the bottom where the ship came apart, which should have been compressed, they appear to have been cleanly broken off. If the ship had broken at the high angle, everything up above should be quite clean and the chaos, the jumbling, should be down at the bottom. As Long talked, he referred to a series of drawings of the ship as it flexed first in one direction, then the other. They showed the bow flooding, the bottom plates falling away, the middle compartments flooding fast, the bow breaking away, and finally, the stern disappearing beneath the surface. He described the breakup beginning at as little as 11 degrees and happening in two stages. The bottom broke separately from the rest of the ship. As those bottom plates ruptured, the middle compartments flooded catastrophically. After that happened, the ship sank suddenly. The breakup was not just something that happened during the final plunge, Long said. The breakup caused the final plunge. It determined whether a lot of people lived or died. One thing is certain. 
the steel doesn't lie. It does not have false memories. It does not protect reputations. It never forgets. The others in the room had been speculating for years about what precisely had happened during Titanic's last moments. Earlier proponents of the low-angle break had come and gone. Defeated by the sensational imagery of the stern rising at a high angle against the star-washed night sky, Roger Long's interpretation of Titanic's last moments, with the evidence from the steel, made more sense than anything else they had ever heard. What you have just said was backed up by personal testimony of the survivors, Park Stevenson said. The launching of the lifeboats was very orderly. The crew appeared to think they had longer to get people off the ship. Crew members actually stated that they did not think the ship was going to sink, David Brown said. They thought it would settle to a certain point and then it would stop sinking. I think everybody thought Titanic would float as its own lifeboat until Carpathia got there. Billy Lang called for a break. Over the buzz of the conversations that erupted around the room, the sound of the door opening and shutting marked the departure of the Associated Press reporter. The story he must have dictated on the telephone made the afternoon editions of the East Coast papers and the next day papers around the world. It quoted Stevenson as saying that Long's low-angle theory depicted the breakup more accurately than ever before and it pointed out that the end would have been even more horrible than previously believed. The reporter recapped the discovery of the wreck in 1985 and quoted Robert Ballard, who balanced Stevenson's enthusiasm by playing down the importance of the discovery. They found a fragment, big deal, Ballard was quoted as saying. Am I surprised? No. When you go down there, there's stuff all over the place. It hit an iceberg and it sank. Get over it. Ballard's remark ignited storms of protest among titaniacs and the mainstream press. Three days later, the New York Times editorialized about the new evidence and what it meant about the last moments in the lives of 1,500 doomed passengers and crew. The Times wagged a critical finger at Ballard's reaction. There is really no getting over Titanic, the paper insisted at least not where the human imagination is concerned. For six months after the Woods Hole meeting, the high-angle versus low-angle controversy dominated the Titaniac forums and email debates. Long supporters cited testimony by survivors that the ship barely disturbed the surface when it disappeared. His detractors cited testimony by other survivors that the final plunge was accompanied by explosions and a wave that swamped lifeboats. James Cameron said the new evidence was interesting, but nowhere near conclusive enough to change his mind about the high-angle break. Roger Long, he said, was Roger wrong. Despite the pieces of the ship found by Chatterton and Kohler, and Long's deductions after analyzing the patterns in the steel, the debate was a stalemate. In early spring 2006, an email to Roger Long from a man named Tom McCluskey changed everything. McCluskey said he had read about Long's version of Titanic's last moments in the newspaper and thought it was the most exciting development since the wreck was discovered. The true story of Titanic has never been told, McCluskey wrote. I know things nobody else knows. Let's talk. Since embarking on their investigation, Chatterton, Kohler, and Long had wasted plenty of time on dead-end leads and crackpot theorists. When they checked McCluskey's background, it looked like he might be the real thing. He had worked at Harland and Wolf from 1965 to 1997, ended his career as the company archivist, and was the author of four books on Olympic-class ships. His access to shipyard records made him the world's most direct living link to the people who had built Titanic. Long put together a package of video footage, Marshall's drawings, and his own sketches, and sent it to McCluskey in Belfast.